Good afternoon again, everyone. For those of you who've joined us over the past few months, welcome back. If you're new to all of this, then, then welcome. Bonjour et bienvenue. Si vous avez nous joined pour nos autres webinars, merci. Si c'est votre première fois, très bien. On espère que vous trouvez la valeur aujourd'hui. I'm Mark Healy. I'm the executive director of the Ivy Academy. That's the learning and development wing of Ivy Business School that's here in London. Je suis le chef d'éducation exécutif à l'école de commerce Ivy. C'est à l'Université de Western, à Ontario. So COVID, 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 it seems uh, that's all we talk about these days. And obviously that's for good reason. But today we're going we're gonna to try to actually take a bit of a COVID break. Um, we're going to instead take a longer term view, try to get away from COVID uh, directly, at least for a little while. You know, here at Ivy, we're starting to spend a lot more time thinking about and talking about where the world is headed uh, in our role and helping to ensure that, you know, we all get to a better place. And uh, part of our work in this area centers on the idea of circular economy. A circular economy is an economic system designed to eliminate waste and pollution, prolong the use of products and materials, regenerate natural systems. It fundamentally enables sustainable development, economic resilience, and it creates opportunity for new products and services and jobs and, uh, and, and whatnot. Um, you know, and despite widespread consensus on the importance of transitioning to a circular economy, major corporate commitments to action, for example, IKEA, They've committed to going fully circular by 2030. Uh, real change is happening kind of slowly. And uh, the question is why? A circular economy requires shifts in both operations and mindsets of organizations that, that need to be much better understood. And so that, that's where we're going to go today with our discussion. You know, as always, we're, we're fortunate to be joined by some very learned guests on, on the matter. And so today we've got with us Ivy's own uh, Yuri Galandris. He's an assistant professor at the Ivy Business School along with Barbara Schwartzentuber, Executive Director of Smart Cities, Office City of Wealth, and Francis Edmonds is with us, Head of Sustainable Impact at HP Canada. So three uh, extremely knowledgeable guests on the topic. Before we jump into it though, Sean, uh, I wanna come to you as always. So Sean Ackland Grand is our Executive Producer. Sean, can you take us uh, through how the, the session is actually gonna run today, please? Sure, thanks Mark and welcome everyone, bienvenue. Today, we're going to start by chatting with each of Yuri, Barbara, and Francis. As they give us a little bit of background to think about, try and draw, draw lines back to your own organizations. Uh, you know, Think about how you've potentially already embraced some of these ideas. Is there a strategic advantage to be gained, especially during COVID? And as you're listening, please feel free to use the chat and Q&A panels to share all of your comments, ideas, and questions for our panelists, uh, as well as other participants. Uh, you can upvote questions you like, uh, and we'll watch for the top submissions throughout. So we look forward to hearing from everyone. And back to you, Mark. John, thanks a lot. Um, Yuri, we're, we're going to start with you. Nice to see you. Um, I think we'd like to start by setting the stage, and uh, maybe we just uh, ask, could you give us kind of a big picture overview of the circular economy concept? Is this a new concept? And can you can you tell us about your work in this area? Hi, Mark. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my work in this area has been has started three years ago. Uh, my specialty is actually in sustainable supply chains more in general. But when I actually came to Canada, I noticed the large amount of waste that our industries here would was we're generating. And so I, I started becoming more passionate about the circular economy. So the, the way I would define this concept is, uh, is essentially a, as an economic system that uh, is characterized by the perpetual movement of products and materials from one useful or uh, purposeful um, application to another value added application. And however, this concept is quite difficult to, to, to master and to understand for some businesses. So if you don't mind, I've prepared a one slide that could somehow uh, present the circular economy from a business standpoint. So I'm gonna share it right now. So can you see the slide? We, yeah, we can see it. Thanks, Yuri. So, uh, you know, I've observed uh, I've developed this, this framework for my own classes and I worked in collaboration with many um, business leaders uh, to develop these ideas. And in this framework, you there are two logics that uh, one business can leverage to actively contribute to the circular economy. And one logic is how can our business reduce the production of waste? And there are a number of practices that you can embrace that goes from the more incremental approaches, such as you know, the well-known lean management, uh, 
uh, that focuses mostly on surplus waste and byproduct waste, uh, up to more transformative approaches, such as changing your business model from a product focus to a, to a service focus, where you have to design your, your products to last longer, to be more durable, and easy to maintain and refurbish, so that you can generate economic value, but also delay the creation of waste, end-of-life waste. On the other side, a, a, a complementary logic to this is how can, uh, how can my business contribute to the circular economy by boosting the consumption of waste? So we already know that there is already a, a lot of waste out there that has been created by industrial activity. And so the question is, how can we extract value from it? And here um, on the transformational side, there is this logic of, that comes from industrial symbiosis work of sourcing and using the waste of others to create valuable products and services. Uh, a famous example here was Interface that spotted that there were large volumes of used fishing nets in, in the shores in developing countries. And they put in place a process to source and use that, that nylon into their carpets. And there are many more similar examples that are developing. But I think this framework really characterizes in a, in a nice way the two logics that a business can leverage to contribute to the circular economy. So that's my sort of long answer to your question. It's, a, it's an excellent uh, frame. You know, it, the logic here seems relatively sound and straightforward. I say, I say that with some trepidation and it, it seems like we have uh, agreement from a, n a number of different bodies and, and players. Why, why is change taking so long in this space? So uh, I think, you know, although there has been agreement on the ends, so the, the establishment of a, of a circular system that reduces waste or, or contributes to the consumption of waste, there isn't really under, a good understanding and agreement on the means. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, in terms of incentives, uh, we know that our economic systems are subject to the so-called externalities. So if there are externalities, essentially, you are not pricing the waste that you produce into your transactions. And therefore, you're not made responsible for the societal uh, and environmental costs that your business activity might create. And so there is this lack of incentive that generates all sorts of misbehaviors on the one hand. But it's not just about lack of willingness because of externalities. I also think it's about a lack of ability. Uh, and, and there are two gaps that our research is trying to qualify and, and investigate. The so-called, or what we call information gap and the capability gap. So information gap is, say for example, your business wants to become more proactive and transformative and do what interface has done. So source some ways that is out there and try to create value out of it. So the question is, what type of waste exists out there? Who produces it and how can we qualify it? So there is no information readily available of these inventories of waste that creates in, that, that exist in the country. Um, so that's one. If I want to start, I don't know where to start because I don't have that information. And second is I've been working with facilitators that try to match organizations and facilitate waste exchanges from one organization to another. Yeah. And they've tried thousands of waste exchanges in the past three years in Canada, and only 10% succeeded. And, and we started analyzing this 10%, and there seem to be very specific operational conditions that need to be in place for the synergy to be successful. So replicating those conditions is not, is not simple uh, and, and requires uh, a lot of work. All right. So, so on the one hand, you know, prob probably fair to say it's relatively early days on this, even though it probably shouldn't be. You know, on the on the other hand, I, if I pick up on a couple of themes there, it sounds like there's a role for education, higher education to play in this space, for research to play in this space. There's also a role for policy and public policy to, to play in this space, which are, I'm sure are themes that we're gonna pick off on as we go through. You're just one more question before we, we move on. Uh, who are you working with in, in this space? Are there sectors that are that are really important or is there anyone in, in particular, you want to call out as having having played a leadership role or doing a good job? Yeah, so 
as you said, education is very important and, and research is very important to first of all, surface all these barriers and, and try to understand them well. So what IB does is looking at micro level aspects such as cognition, how managers assess waste or how they could assess waste and then operational aspects such as the design of new supply chain systems and also contributing to new EPR policy frameworks that should overcome externality problems and enable firms to act. So when we are doing this research work at the micro and macro level, we are working in three industry sectors or three sectors, I would say. We started working in the food sector, mostly because there is a, a very bad statistic in Canada, which is 60% of all the food produced in our systems go wasted. Uh, and that is, and an unbelievable that is an unbelievable number. Yeah. And so we started working with uh, Maple Leaf Food, Walmart, and, uh, and facilitators of waste exchanges such as CTTI in Montreal, uh, NISP in, in Vancouver, and uh, PPPG in, uh, in, uh, in Toronto. We are also working in the plastic space and developing some nice case studies. Uh, we work with Francis that is here today at HP. They're very progressive um, in for what concerns circularity for plastics. And, uh, and we working also uh, on the food side, we are also starting a collaboration with, with the city of Guelph uh, to study how the system level can, how the system can be transformed to become fully circular. So HP, for what concerns plastic, very active, Philips too, uh, as well as we are working with a &W on another case where they are reconsidering their plastic packaging and the solutions that could be embraced. And on the food, I would say Maple Leaf Food uh, and, uh, and City of Guelph, as well as other facilitators that I mentioned. Okay, uh, ex excellent uh, architecture, I think, for the conversation. Good good map for us. Barbara, we want to spend a little bit of time with, with you next. You're, um, you're joining us from the City of Guelph. Uh, your project was a major, one of the major winning initiatives through the Smart Cities Challenge by Infrastructure Canada. And you know, maybe we could start on that. Can you tell us a bit about Smart Cities and the Our Food Future Initiative? Sure. Um, yeah, we uh, we were the lucky winners of uh, one of four winners of the Smart Cities Challenge. We won ten million dollars, which, you know, I have to say, certainly having the funding has uh, goes a long way to creating change at the local level. Um, so our project is to create uh, our food future is to create a Canada's first circular food economy, mm -hmm. certainly supported and enabled by data and technology, but um, probably even most importantly by social innovation and commitment from from all of our residents and uh, various sectors to to create uh, a, a economy, a food system where there isn't the waste that Yuri mentioned uh, and where every resident has access to healthy, nutritious food. So this project is um, because it is any anytime you talk about the circular economy it has to be about system level change. This project has three interconnected goals and those are to increase access to healthy, nutritious food for residents to create new circular food businesses and collaborations because you really need to work on that sector uh, in order to, to create economic change. And then to find new, um, new economic benefits, not only from preventing waste, but as Yuri spoke about repurposing or understanding how we can use uh, waste, or what we now consider to be waste. So we have projects and interventions underway supporting each of those three goals. And what we're trying to do is test out interventions in a place-based setting so that we can understand um, the, the many areas where you need to intervene in order to create that system level change. So we really turned, it, it's a project that we're doing with the city of Guelph and the county of Wellington. So it's really unique in that way. It's a rural urban project and we're really trying to create a living lab where, you know, social innovators and researchers and data and tech um, knowledge folks can come together and really try to solve some of those food system challenges and to create the innovation. So we're, we're working towards um, trying to understand what a good food community of the future might look like, uh, one where you don't have those awful 
cases of you know waste and overabundance on one hand and um, inequitable access on another, um, and uh, that fully supports people to lead healthy lives and um, and that in 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 doing so that we don't uh, that we minimize our environmental impact. I think you've been you yourself and the initiative have have both been called pioneers in this space. Do you do you embrace, do you embrace that? Do you think of yourself in that way? Oh, you know, it's um, you know what we did uh, to uh, identify what the challenge was that we were going to put forward to the Smart Cities Challenge is we went and we looked number one at what's our strength in um, Guelph and Wellington, and certainly we have a deep history in um, agri food, yeah, and right. then we went to each of the sectors that are already working: the environmentalists, the people looking at food insecurity, the folks that are looking at uh, innovation from a business point of view and new technology. Mm -hmm. And we talked to each of them about, you know, what is their perspective on the problem? And I think the pioneering part of this actually is the fact that we found the concept of the circular economy as a way that brought all of these sectors, the power of all of these sectors and their commitment and their leadership and the work they were doing together in order to create this, this change. And, you know, I'm, I'm fully convinced that if we're going to make progress in the circular economy, it has to be a place-based transition at the local level that's complementary to the things that are happening that you'll hear about Hewlett Packard and others are doing today. Um, but we really need um, to look at the demand side of the equation. So, in, in Guelph and Wellington, people are really beginning to embrace this idea and um, they really are committed to, you know, kind trying to change the circumstances in which they are purchasing things, the way in which they use food, the connection to their local producers. So I think, um, I think from a, from, you know, a pioneering point of view, those are the things that I would point to. One more question before we, we turn to, to Francis. Um, um, one of the questions that actually came in through the Q&A already was around this idea of public-private partnership or folks from those two sectors working working together. You've had some experience already with that. How, how is that going? Has that been an enabler? Has it helped? Has it been a challenge? Um, it's really been a, an enabler. We've had um, businesses like Maple Leaf Food and others sort of um, helping us um, pull the concept together. And now that the community um, and the vision is clear and the projects are starting to roll out, um, the private sector is really playing an important role. So for instance, one of our partners, Provision Coalition, is a private sector organization that helps uh, food and beverage businesses to reduce waste and to repurpose it. And they launched um, uh, a, a fully circular meal. So they connected up seven businesses uh, that had waste streams uh, that could be repurposed by the next business. Mm -hmm. And then the, the food products that came out of that are one of our restaurant chains that is a B Corp put on a fully circular meal. So we're seeing innovation happening. We, we sort of set the table in the sense that we've created this collaborative platform and we're seeing innovation starting to happen a little bit organically and to grow. And, and certainly we're looking forward to working with Ivy on, on helping, helping us understand some of the possibilities there as well. Hey, th thanks a lot, Barbara. Appreciate it. Francis, let, let's spend a, a few minutes with, with you directly before we bring the whole, the whole panel together. Um, so, I, I, you know, as, as I understand it, for, for 40 years, really, we've been recycling plastics in Canada, trying to live the slogan, reduce, reuse, recycle. So why at this point do, do, we, do we need to do something different with plastics? And then can you talk a bit about uh, what, you, what you're doing with HP that's, that's a bit different today? Sure. So I guess I would equate, even though most Canadians think that our uh, consumer recycling programs are circular, 
um, they're actually a linear system. We've discovered to our horror that many of the plastics were dutifully rinsing and putting into our blue bins or wherever they are, whatever the system is across the country, are not actually getting recycled. And that was a bit of a shock to Canadians. There's a whole bunch of factors that go into that. But if I sort of pull it back to, you know, can plastics be circular? Absolutely, they can. And uh, HP's example is... Uh, for about 30 years, we've been taking back our products and recycling them. And um, 20 years ago, one of our engineers was sitting there going, well, we take all this valuable plastic back and we're putting it into things like uh, trays and wire spools. And couldn't we do better than that? Could we not put those plastics back into the same product? And ironically, that is called upcycling. I don't get why, because it's really the same cycling, but it's called upcycling. And I think that's in contrast to the fact that most plastics, if they do get recycled, get downcycled. And uh, in some cases, they even call burning recycling, which of course it's not. Um, so we searched globally at that point, looking for some expertise in plastics recycling technology. And guess where we ended up? Montreal, Canada. Mm -hmm. So it is Canadian expertise that has enabled HP to make the plastics that we use today fully circular and not just one time. The plastic chemistry we've developed can actually keep going around and around and around. And uh, it's very exciting to see the possibilities there. And then of course, once we had established this, we realized we weren't getting enough of our own products back. So we had to put in used plastics from other sources, post-consumer sources. So let's make sure we're specifying not just factory scrapings off the floor. These are plastics that have gone out, served a purpose and come back again. So today we're doing this at such a scale that we use a million used drinking water bottles a day in this process in Montreal. Yeah. So it's happening at scale and it's possible. Um, I want to talk about the um, the impact of oil prices. Um, you know, with so one one once in a blue moon, I was a chemical engineer and I and I worked vaguely in this area. I worked with enzyme treatment and thinking about environmental impact. And the talk at the time was oil prices would just continue to go up and up and up. And that would have some effects on all of this because it would put pressure, particularly on plastic makers, to not be able to use virgin plastic because it would just be too expensive. That that has not come to pass, right? Oil prices at almost historical lows in some ways. What what impact is that having on virgin plastics and the, the you know pressure either for or against some of what you're arguing for? Right. So before COVID, we had actually set a, um, a 2025 goal to have 30% post-consumer recycled plastic across our PC and, and print portfolio. And I know most people on the, the line here are probably thinking, well, 30%, that's not very much. Uh, <laughs> if I told you that the best data I have is that the average in electronics today is about 2%, you'd go, oh, well, maybe that is a, a big deal. <clears throat> And of course, then COVID and the oil price crash. Um, and of course, many people don't know that plastic is made from oil. So I'll just make that point. Um, so then it puts us in a dilemma. We have this big goal. It was a, a pretty hairy, audacious goal. And we weren't sure how we were going to meet it. And as COVID hit and businesses, all businesses are struggling, um, will we back off on that that commitment to use 30%? Because obviously, and this is the, the link into procurement here, most customers today, even if they say they're buying with sustainability in mind, are not. And we very rarely see a requirement at any level of government, consumer or business for a requirement for recycled content in there. Um, so we're not playing in a level market, play, market field when we're, when we're trying to sell products that contain recycled content and it's costing us more. Um, so we've got a real problem here, and this is a really good example of a circular economy issue where you're competing against producers who are making products that are effectively disposable. And they're playing in the linear economy to, to the demand signal that, that buyers are putting into the market, which is sell me the lowest price thing you can get, get to my door. And that just encourages all the wrong behavior. So, so there's some, some tensions here that Yuri was starting to um, indicate that uh, unless we can have some level playing field or that demand signal from the buyers, we're going to have some problems. The good news is HP is not backed off on our 30% goal. Uh, and in fact, we doubled down on purchasing the ocean bound plastics, which are coming from Haiti and going straight to Montreal for processing. So that was the good news. Good for you. That's, that's, that's great. I think, um, I think we'd like to, to pull everyone together, get into a, a bit of a panel discussion you know, I've got a few questions I'd like to take us through, but before we go there, Yuri, you've been you've been all 
all over the chat in the Q&A, uh, ha handling questions as they've been coming in live. Do you want to just maybe recap a little bit about um, some, some of the comments that have come in and the questions you've addressed? Uh, I think it has been a fascinating conversation so far, both uh, by, by the panelists as well as the contributors. And I'd like uh, to start by sharing a few, a couple of visuals that describe uh, our understanding of the circular economy so far based on our research. So that, you know, when we can sometimes see something, we can better understand something. So let, let me perhaps share my slides uh, once again. Okay, so now, so if we, one example, um, can you see uh, this diagram, Mark? Yes, it, it looks like a it looks like a circuit board. Uh, so yeah, it looks like that, but essentially the the squares are organizations, the uh, black lines are. I mean, maybe perhaps. Uh, the black lines are um, the squares are organizations. It goes from upstream to downstream. So this is a linear supply chain from essentially farmers to uh, processors, manufacturers, and then down here, retailers, restaurants, consumers. And the black lines are um, traditional material flows in the linear system. And then the green uh, lines are waste exchanges that cut diagonally across this, uh, across this system. Mm -hmm. What is surprising is that uh, this supply chains intertwine with waste exchanges is what we are mapping in the Montreal metropolitan area. So we have quantified um, about 30 synergies and so far or uh, 30 waste exchanges. And it's really beautiful to see how these exchanges are actually growing organically without any government intervention. Mm -hmm. And so we are studying there what is it what is it that makes these managers capable of seeing uh, value in in each other waste first and second is what which one of these synergies are here to last and therefore what operational processes have been put in place to make them uh, productive economically and environmentally and so this is one example of what we are doing uh, in montreal and what we are going to do in in guelph uh, to better understand system level dynamics at, uh, and, and how they build on micro level enablers and, and meso level enablers, meaning the supply chain operations. So this is in the food sector and is a good example of an emerging circular bioeconomy. And uh, this one instead is what Francis was uh, trying to explain and, and, and she did a fantastic job. Uh, and we are working together in mapping out their circular supply chain, which is composed by two main elements. The linear supply chains that you can see on top of this slide, from raw materials to polymer production, plastic raising production, uh, product production, and then use, and then end of, end of life, and then eventually, in the current system, landfill and incineration. And we mapped out, and here is a simplified version of the processes that were put in place in the reverse supply chain. So linear and reverse supply chain together compose the circular system for plastic. This system is international, which is different than the food system that I mentioned before, which is rather localized. Mm. And uh, it involves a number of players in the collection of plastic through different programs. This can be municipalities, but also private actors such as Best Buy, for example, uh, and other retailers or HP themselves, because they have put in place a long time ago, this closed loop collection systems for their cartridges. And everything goes to uh, Laverne with uh, facilities that we mapped out in terms of technologies they use and processes. Mm -hmm. And for the creation of different types of uh, raising that can then be used back into currently cartridges and printers. But the applications for this raising is expanding over time. Uh, really, for, for this system, what is fascinating is that uh, it's a chicken and egg problem, where on the one hand, if there's no demand for recycled uh, content, you cannot justify investment. But without investment, you cannot serve demand. Mm. And so that's why most circular economies struggle 
to 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 develop because you have to work simult simultaneously on generating demand and establishing supply uh, so that they go hands in hand but easy to say a bit more difficult to do yeah it's, it sounds like uh in, in, in a different system or in a, in a different uh, analog, you you would want stimulus or you'd want an external uh, b boost or starting point. And so if you know if we think about um, circular procurement, interfirm collaborations, you know how, how for all three of you, how, how is that how is that going? Are there barriers and do, and do you feel like you need intervention, you know either from from government or from ex from some external force in order to start the cycle? Uh, I'm happy to start, but if Francis and Barb would like to start, I, I'm happy to give them the floor. Why don't we have Barbara start? Sorry, I was trying to answer a question. Was that a question about circular procurement? Mm -hmm. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Is 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 circular? You know, in your experience, the circular procurement is that part of this, and is it is it going to get going on its own, or do we need a, a external stimulus to get it going? Um, no, I I don't. I don't think it's going to get going on its own, um, but there's quite a lot of work happening around circular procurement and particularly the leverage that governments uh, can have when they start to purchase from a circular procurement point of view. So um, I think what we need to do is um, is start that process of um, explaining why circular procurement is the path forward and um, helping, I think, local governments in particular start to leverage their spend in order to create change at the local level. I was I was busy answering a question in the chat, which really is, do you, you know, do you need all these things to happen at once? And the answer is is yes. You know, you need to be trying interventions. You need to be looking at the levers that each level of government has. You need to be investigating um, the opportunities and doing the research. You need to be supporting companies as they make that transition. So um, it really is, in my perspective, a social, a mass of socioeconomic transition. And you, you sort of have to treat it like a movement that needs um, support on multiple levels in order to keep, um, to affect change. Francis, I saw you, you coming off mute a minute ago. What, what's your view here? Yeah, so um, we funded some research looking into how Canadian governments at all level across the country buy, and um, the results were pretty discouraging. Uh, and interestingly enough, you know, if you just took green procurement as a subset of sustainable or circular procurement, you know, we had it in the throne speech 25 years ago, and so not much has changed. And so... It, it, I really believe very strongly and increasingly strongly as I get more into this, that procurement is the key lever. Um, and everybody wants to say, yes, it's a good idea, but we can't really do it because of X, Y, and Z. And we've got a, a, a dastardly combination of this. Uh, I had a quote the other day, the tyranny of lowest price. Our public servants who are buying for, on behalf of us as taxpayers always believe and have had this hammered into them that lowest price is, is the best price. And until we can shake that, we're really going to have some problems. Uh, they, feel, they really do feel they're doing their fiduciary responsibility by buying the lowest price. And what we need to do, of course, using the, the dollar as a proxy for the value we're getting, as, as Yuri pointed out, we're missing all those externalities. And even within an organization, particularly if you're buying technology, if you're not considering the end of first life and the operating costs of running that equipment, you're actually not even using the dollar as a total proxy for the value you're getting, right? Yeah. It, it's it's half use of the dollar. Um, so so that's something we really have to overcome. And uh, I'm trying a whole bunch of different things to, to help change that. But at the end of the day, it's about using total cost of ownership or best value, which we are seeing some uh, small commodities being purchased and vehicles is a, a good example of that. That as we transition to electric, electric vehicles, that's often a, an easy one to do. But uh, the complexity, the interrelatedness of stuff. And, and generally, you know, Canadians are pretty undereducated in sustainability. You know, um, we're talking with a, a, an academic institution here, but uh, most academic institutions are not graduating graduates who know what a carbon footprint is. 
Like we, we really have a problem there, you know, and, and we're in the decade of climate action. The, 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 the climate catastrophe is upon us. And, you know, as Barbara says, we have to work on all of this stuff all at once. So uh, great that Ivy's playing a role in this, but uh, more, faster, quicker, please. Yuri, do you want to chime in before we move move on here? Yeah, I, so a couple of reflections and, and my, my viewpoints. Uh, so certainly I agree with education. That's why we are we have this very large and expanding um, circular economy research program that is feeding directly into our teaching. So, for example, the slides that I show today, those models, they develop as we do research and I use them in my classes. And, and we also use develop new case studies with HP and others that can somehow bring examples and illustration. So education is key and we should doing we should be doing more of that. In terms of circular procurement, I would like to unpack a little bit as I do in my classes, the drivers of why it's not taking off. Mm. If we think about that is, first of all, price, I completely agree. So this logic of instead of buying what minimizes our total cost over the life cycle of what we buy, we focus only on minimizing price, that's correct. The second piece, there is a, an internal accountability problem. So. Uh, Buyers uh, are not made responsible for, for the, ch the choices that they make. And, and therefore they are not stimulated to think more carefully about the implications of what they buy. And third, there is a very difficult verification problem. So when you try to rank suppliers based on their sustainability performance, how do you measure that sustainability performance? There are many multiple ways. How do you verify that those information are, are appropriate? So I think even in this case, policy can, can help uh, by introducing new requirements for disclosure, as well as thinking more carefully about uh, extended producer responsibility so that the producers are made responsible of the sinks, so at the end of life and they need to think about designing their products in such a way that will minimize for them the cost of taking it back or the cost of someone else to buy it out. I, I wanna to get to some of the, some of the questions in the, in the Q and A, uh, but, but just before we go there, I, I, wanna, I wanna bridge uh, one more time through the, the public sector side of this. And I guess um, your question would be, you know, what? What regulatory either measures or incentives, in your view, could, you know, either are starting or or could be put in that would make a meaningful meaningful difference here? Yuri, why don't we start with you and then we'll go back around? Yeah. So uh, again, I I want to repeat our approach in our classes is always the same. We focus on a sustainability issue. We unpack the drivers. And then we think about solutions that tackle those drivers because focusing on the symptoms will never create change. Yeah. So if you think about what we discussed so far, what I presented, what Francis mentioned, what Barb indicated, is that uh, essentially there is a, a, a lack of demand being a key factor of why we're not moving. Then the other problem is externalities that do not incentivize companies to make uh, investment. Mm -hmm. And and then there is also an ability problem. Even if we are incentivized, how do we do it? So every intervention should think about these three aspects altogether: how we stimulate demand, how we capture externalities, and how we educate individuals. So from a policy standpoint, if you think about how to stimulate demand, that can can potentially happen through uh, through EPR. Like essentially you are making sure that the end of life is your responsibility. So you need to take it back. You need to create a value out of it. And so that might foster this, this demand in secondary markets. Although, again, I'm, I'm sure it will be more difficult than, than what I'm saying. The second problem is externalities. And, and I think uh, Taxes sometimes are thought to be useful because they make you pay for, for the problem. But again, we have seen that taxes usually do not lead to investment by organizations, but just the maximization process of, of their production processes. And so I think even there, 
a well-designed EPR might help. And then finally, uh, in terms of uh, verification problems that we, we mentioned, disclosure efforts should, should go beyond the GRI practices and the UN Global Compact that we have seen so far. There is so much more to be done there in terms of disclosing. Uh, for example, not just disclosing where the products come from, but how many products do we inject in certain geographical markets? Because at that point, we can be made responsible for taking them back or put in place infrastructure that take them back. Francis, what's your, what's your view here? <clears throat> I'm going to disagree that EPR will get us to where we need to be because we've had EPR programs in Canada for more than 30 years and they're, you know, they're not working today. And some would argue it's because they're not being implemented properly. But <clears throat> excuse me, given that we have a decade to fix climate change, um, I'm going to say that's that's been tried and not successful. So you're asking for, for what could we do from a public policy perspective? Um, yeah. I think if every... RFP that went out there, every bid document required the carbon footprint of the service that's being provided, uh, including scope three, of course, um, and the footprint of the company delivering them, um, what gets measured gets managed. That's a very, you know, that information is not available today for the most part. And so that would stimulate a whole bunch of work and um, realizations. And then of course, setting some uh, reduction requirements that are science-based. Um, you know, we only have 16 Canadian companies that have science-based targets for carbon reduction set. That is, how can that be in the decade of climate action, right? Um, these are things that contribute to circularity because if you understand what the footprint of your raw material inputs are and are being called upon to reduce them, you'll be actively pulling from the stuff that you've taken back or that is available for uh, as quote unquote waste. And then the easy one for me is, um, you know, everybody's concerned about plastics and it's in everything. Um, why aren't we setting minimum, uh, maybe aggregate across all of your product portfolio, but, you know, meet a 30% uh, post-consumer recycle content uh, goal in across your product portfolio. And how do you measure that? Uh, one of the things we didn't get into is, is recycled plastics are more expensive, post-consumer are more expensive than virgin. There's a lot of cheating going on. Uh, companies actually selling plastic as recycled when it's not at all, it's actually virgin. So that verification and validation that it really is what you say it is. So it's two key things I think that could help move the market. Thank you. Barbara, you know, economic uh, measures, fiscal policy, monetary policy, taxes, incentives, grants, is there a role for, for public policy to play directly here to get things going? Yeah, I definitely, um, I definitely think there is a role, and um, I, I, my Yuri had those three great things: stimulate demand, capture externalities, and expand capabilities. And I was trying to think what are what would my three be, and it's certainly awareness and a little bit of outrage. I mean, I'm learning things here today that that I didn't. I didn't entirely know about. And then I think it's um, demonstrating what the art of the possible is. So, you know, leaders like HP and others showing the way forward. Leadership is tremendously important from the private sector. But um, the at a national level, we really need some strong market signals in forms of policies and in forms of uh, strategies from the federal government. Um, same at the provincial level, but at the municipal level, it it is difficult to create change, but it's certainly possible and we're seeing that here. I would also say that um, we need to change things like uh, the financing and uh, the funding system for, for new companies to start that are, are more circular. And our project has a harvest impact fund that will be about social finance and impact funding. So I think um, I think there's things that have to happen at all levels. I'm not sure about taxation, but I, I certainly do agree about procurement. And I also agree that um, we have to start asking for those measures and transparency from, from companies. But you know, that all comes back to consumers creating the demand so that politicians can do the right thing and have the support in order to create those changes. 
Let's get to some. There were overwhelmed in, in questions in the Q and A in the chat uh, more more than we would typically get. Sh Sean, I think you've been probably watching these as as they've been coming in. Are there any you think we should definitely get to at the top of the list? There was one question about uh, the waste economy and whether you know, especially in areas like agriculture, whether there's sort of a taboo around this. So, if I may speak to it. Um... In the agriculture uh, sector, at least as I've seen now, um, I, I would like to have a note, a positive note. We discussed many problems and we discussed drivers for each problem. But my observation, uh, and perhaps is anecdotal at, at this point, but I've seen it uh, playing across, say, 20, 30 organizations in the agri-food sector, is that there is so much agility in the system to do a lot without major structural investments. So there are several types of uh, food waste streams that are very easy to avoid if we pay attention to them and or they are very easy to inject back into the system. So there are very stable uh, streams and with poor contamination that can be used and integrated into operations by many organizations. Let me make a few examples. So um, I know a company that produces uh, fresh pressed juices out of the surplus, the inventory mismatch of retailers. So you have these vegetables and bananas and you take them, you press them and there is fresh juices coming out. The pulp of the, of the juice that is not used is it could go to landfill, but instead there are other organizations that are taking that pulp and using into and using it into tea for the flavoring, and using into uh, soaps. So not even edible food, but also other type of products, soaps. They are using it into cookies, upcycle cookies. Spent grain can be used for high quality flour. Um, even aquafava, that is the byproduct of the production of moss vegetables, can be uh, used into, uh, into pet food and other applications or, or, or fed to, to some insects. For example, insects, there is a growing business that I know they are using the byproduct of the byproduct. So you take the spent grain, you make flour, along the production of the flour, you have a byproduct. You can use that byproduct to, fill, to feed insects and then you can dry them. And there are two applications, energy bars for humans, uh, and as well as um, a lot of applications in terms of uh, fertilizers. So these all examples that I mentioned showed, and they haven't made huge investments into their equipment and infrastructures. So there is a lot of agility that we are not aware of in the system that is there for us to, to exploit. Let, let's do a, a few others that have come in. There's, um, there's a question here around labels and waste metrics. And uh, you know, are there examples of uh, any initiatives underway around you know, either, either forcing or asking producers to put anything on labels around waste? So I'm sorry, I, I, I'm Italian, I talk a lot. Uh, I, this is a conversation we had with Francis and, and a few others and label, there is a multiplication of labels now in market, in, in different markets. Uh, and, and the problem of what I've seen so far is that labels seem to enable change, but only incremental. And the reason is that if you force uh, producers to, to be certified according to certain labels, there will be only, and this Francis is something that she knows very well, there will be so few that are capable of receiving that certification that, that the market will, will shrink. And at that point, buyers will be over dependent on few suppliers and, and they don't want it. And that's why they don't ask for aggressive certifications and labels because it, it, it will indirectly constrain their market. So, Change through labels is something that is possible, but mostly incremental, in my view. I, I'm just gonna, gonna jump in there. And of course, um, if you're not familiar with the sins of greenwashing, I'd encourage you to go and read up on that a little. Um, 
false labeling is very prevalent <laughs> where people stick a label on that that you know looks bona fide and, and of course if you try to do any research on it it's not a real label it's a made-up label so um th this this ability to certify that something is what it is 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 critical but also to do it in a way that doesn't significantly increase the cost and if you look at certifying plastics for instance you know, if, if, if post-consumer recycled plastic is already more expensive than virgin plastic, and then you add a requirement to certify that on top, which is really a supply chain tracking like FSC does, uh, you can make it even more expensive, which is a disincentive to use it. So, so we've got to be careful that we don't trip ourselves up in uh, the, the means defeating the end. No good uh, answer there. We've, we've managed to stay away from COVID for 51 minutes, but, you know, here we are, we're going to ask this question. If if we think about COVID as a disruption to the status quo, it, it wouldn't be the only one that we could imagine, but here it is. There's a there's a question here in the Q&A. Do we think a disruption to the status quo will allow for or enable across the board change? Uh, te teleworking is listed as an example, which would be an outcome of one of the outcomes of, of COVID. Does, it, does that create enough of an externality to create a bit of a wobble in the system here? Barb, maybe, maybe we'll start with you. Yeah, it certainly has for us um, because COVID has uh, really exposed some of the vulnerabilities of the food system. And so it's uh, increased awareness and we've been able to um, utilize this as an opportunity to help um, people get connected um, with their local producers, their local food producers. We've been able to use our initiative um, to uh, create a better uh, approach to getting people emergency food. We've created some challenges around urban agriculture so that um, the community can come together and, and uh, create some new ideas about how we grow um, fresh food in urban areas. So we've, um, we used it to uh, pivot our initiative and to respond and to, create a plan called Grow Back Better so that we can get um, the money out the door. We can put back, um, you know, right in front of people what the importance is of their role within the food system. So I would say yes. And, you know, from, from another perspective in ter terms of policy and strategy change, look what's happened from a federal, a provincial government point of view, things that would have taken a monumental years in order to change suddenly changed overnight and um, and so we now know that the capacity to be for flexibility and for rapid change is there um, we just have to figure out how to help them use it for good I'm just going to jump in there with a uh, I don't know if you listened to the debate yesterday in the House of Parliament but uh, you know why don't we have Canadian manufacturing for vaccines you know, that's that's a really good example of, uh, oh, heck, our supply chains have gotten so long and so spread out that we don't have domestic production anymore. And, uh, you know, one of the things that was good for HP out of COVID was suddenly this realization that 3D print was an important thing and a way to shorten supply chains. So we're we're. Um, the companies that bought HP 3D printers and now we, we collaborated with them and the federal government to actually um, have all of the 3D printers that we that are, were available in Canada start printing the headbands for the face shields for frontline workers because they, they just weren't available if you tried to go on the open market because there was such a demand. So that gave us the ability to demonstrate that, that, that way to, to to turn very quickly into a very shortened supply chain. And uh, I think we'll see a lot more of that. There's a question here about, about ownership. Um, there's a, a, a good friend of the school of the academy who's talking a lot these days about um, employee ownership as a, as a public policy uh, movement. Question here is similar. What, what role would local or broad-based ownership play in the willingness to adopt a circular economy? In other words, in other words, if that was um, if that was a center point of sort of economic policy, trying to move toward local or broad based ownership, would it make a difference? Can I can I weigh in on that one? I um, you know we're starting to see in many of our projects the concept of cooperatives come up, like cooperative food hubs, cooperative approaches to um, you know across sectors in order to fund some kinds of transformations that need to happen. So I would, 
I, I found it interesting. We also are working on a data utility cooperative uh, platform where various partners can share data for, for use across sectors. And it, it sounds simple, but it's really hard. But that, that again is that cooperative model. So I, I, I see it just keep coming up whenever we try to move forward on a project or an intervention, inevitably that becomes a fork in the road kind of conversation. I, Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. So I think this is very important for us. And I agree with Barb, uh, collaboration and cooperatives are the, the way forward in different sectors. And, uh, and firms need to realize this and policymakers too. Uh, we, we know from um, Nobel Prize, Eleanor Estrom, uh, that uh, ownership and privatization uh, sometimes do not work. What we need is collective action and for collective action to happen, to establish the right uh, institutional conditions to foster this collaboration between organizations. If you started to think in terms of ownership, which some, to an extent EPR does, uh, you make sure that the producer are responsible for the waste that they generate. And so they wanna take good care of it. Uh, at the same time, there are all sorts of free riding and, and, uh, and pricing issues around waste and, and quality issues uh, because you lose control over what's happening in the system. In a collective space, you have firms that instead need to work together to find new co-creation processes. And what I see is very challenging for now, at least between organizations is, is value redistribution. So we create this together, but what are the mechanisms that we put in place that we can all benefit from the value that we create? And so how can be the circular economy, not just environmentally sustainable, but, but socially equitable. And, and I think that's where we need more work. Not just we need collaboration and not simply ownership, but how that collaboration should be working. What mechanisms of value creation and redistribution should we put in place? Thank you. We're just we're just about out of time. I want to make sure that uh, Francis and Barbara get a couple of last words each. Fr Francis, any closing thoughts from you? I'd just ask us all to think about every dollar we spend as sending a signal into the marketplace and to really reassess that tyranny of the lowest price and start to think about value. Barbara, how about you? Uh, no, it's been it's been great. Every time I participate in one of these panels with smart people, I learn so many more things. I've been busy writing at the same time. I would um, I would just say if you want to follow our work, you know, advice for us, we're we're open or opportunities to collaborate. Um, I've put our our website in the chat. Thank you. Sean, as, as usual, we didn't get to all, all the questions and comments. We did get uh, to some of them. What what happens from here, please? Sure. So we've got a, a bunch of leftover questions. We also saw a ton of links and resources and suggestions shared in the chat. So I think what we'll do is we'll collect all of those questions as well as some of the links from the center uh, and send them out along with the follow up recording. Uh, so just keep an eye out uh, for your email. We'll we'll send that tomorrow. Um, we also post uh, regular articles on our blog, so if you'd like to, uh, to follow us on your preferred social channel or subscribe to our newsletter, you'll get invites for, uh, for future panels. Thanks. I'll just conclude by uh, agreeing with, uh, with Barbara. I, I learned a lot today, too, uh, to, to all of our panelists. Thanks for joining us. You were so generous with your time in the prep all the way through, uh, and, and today, thanks to Matthew Lynch and, and Rob and all the all the folks uh, here at Ivy who, who helped to tee this up. Yuri, great job. And um, for all of you who tuned in, I appreciate it. Thanks for spending the time with us. We'll see you next time. Cheers. Thank you.